Welcome back to the Fishing Daily Podcast. This is episode 9 of series 4. And thank you for joining us again. And this episode I'm joined by my guest Bernie Cunningham of Swan Net Gundry. And we'll be talking about his career and all the places that he has visited in the 50 years that he was with the company. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for asking me to do this interview. Well, thank you. I'm, deli- I'm delighted. For joining you. <laughs> yeah. So we've often read uh, interviews uh, with you beforehand. So yeah. this time I would like to hear your hear it in your own words because the, your history is uh, and the industry is amazing. 50 years yeah. with Swanette. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll have a little chat, first of all, about uh, where it all started for you. Well, I'll tell you, before I started in Swanette, I actually started working with an English guy by the name of Roger Hutchins. He was, uh, he came from Dorset, but he was sent over by Britport, Gundry, in, in Britport, in south of England. Now. And uh, one of my best friends actually got me a job there, Charles Boyle. Like I think Charles started up a good career for me, you know. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, he was a great, he was ahead of his time as a netman, Roger. Unfortunately, he had personal problems. And the factory, we started out, you know where the fish and meal plant is? It's at Killy Bags. Yes. In a small factory out there, uh, down below where the offices are. That's where it started. And who worked there that time was uh, two mechanics, Jim and Mick. Jerry McInorn, who went on to be a successful skipper. So did Charles Boyle, my friend, and uh, Donald Cannon, another great man at Nets. Unfortunately, he's dead now too, you know. But uh, as I said, due to personal problems, the, the, the company folded up. So I went fishing then for a couple of years. And the first boat I went fishing was Con McGinnis on the EFG and Gilded. And after that, I went to fish, believe it or not, and you might have heard about this vessel, the Carriguna. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was lost off Rat in the Burn. But I uh, packed up the fishing before that. It was always my ambition to work ashore at Nets. And by good luck, I was working at a net one day for the late Dennis Carberry, who died this year. He was the former skipper that Carriguna when I was on it, Jim. I was working on that for repairing that for him over at the co-op shed and then to the yard walks Albert Swan. Albert was just getting out of the fishing at that time. Late, that was late 1973. And uh, he asked me would I be interested in going to Sweden to learn about design and production. Albert used to buy his trawls from Sweden that time in a place called Smogen on the west coast of Sweden. So I was sent out there for about three months. Yeah, I was, learned a lot in that company. They made uh, nets for us, smaller power boats. So the guy in Sweden, his name was Bengt Severson, suggested to Albert that I should be sent on a further course to Denmark later that year, which was uh, Herschel's Bodog Trollbundry, based in Herschel's. It's now called Cosmos Trail. So I went there for another few months. But the difference in two, two factors was that the one in Denmark was a higher level. So all that technology in design and production, I brought back to Swanets and cooperated with Albert from day one on design, showing how the, how I was showing how to cut tapers, how is to make rope settings, all the basic fundamentals to make a good trawl. So that's how it all started. And it started in the Carpet Factory in 1974. That's why I wanted to retire this year after 50 years. And the year I was in Sweden, actually, was the year ABBA won the Eurovision. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a good memory, too. Like. There have been a lot of celebrations <laughs> going on at that time. Yeah. And we started, as they say, from humble beginnings up in the Carpet Factory. The first year, we actually made a lot of white fish trials because 1974 was the f- year some people were a member of the oil crisis in world globally. A-, a lot of boats went pair trawling, 
white fish boats went perked on because it was easier on the on the diesel and stuff again. We made a lot of pair trawls out there. We had a very popular model called the Star Trawl, pair trawling for whitefish. And I remember the first one I made when I started in Kiliwags, in the sun, way the cinema in Kiliwags that time. I was sitting in the cinema and I heard one of my colleagues beside me, I heard one of your vessels coming unloaded with cod. <laughs> that was the first night I made. Of course, I was shuffed at that. <laughs> he wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> Not that then we got more involved in pelagic. And probably the, the what made Swan Nets really in pelagic is we never sat on the one design. I remember when we, uh, if you're talking about midwire trolls, mm -hmm. the biggest mesh size on the wing of the trawl when I started was 400 millimeter half mesh. But we kept advancing with design. Went up down to 800 miller in the, in the four part net. Then we went up to 1600, 3200, and 64, and 12.8 half mesh. Basically, because uh, easier tone and for the larger vessels too, could make a, a trawl of bigger volume. For catching process, yeah. And uh, what made us to in uh, Scotland and Shetland, I would say, was as, as you know, uh, purse, purse netting is a very successful way of catching fish. But there are three pairs went up from Killybags to fish up and off Shetland, trawling. Purse was right in for fishing on the surface, you know. You, yeah. But at the time they went up, the fish were down at the bottom. So you can put a trawl down to the bottom, or you can fish it on the surface. And I, I'm only quoting from what skippers told me in Shetland, Scotland, that uh, they were, they were, the pursers were waiting for the fish to come up. But these bears, that they came up, loaded their boats twice, and that changed their mindset to trawl. So in Shetland, there is 100% trawling. Scotland, there's a couple of boats still do personal before Christmas. But basically, they all turned to Solon after that. And that was a good uh, boost for Swan Nets because they were using our trolls. Yeah. yeah the, when, when they seen what was happening, it, it was a, yeah. a major change for them to, or a yeah. decision for them to, to make the change and, and to right. improve the way that they were, they were fishing. Over the years, there's been a great evolution in, in, in fishing vessels as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've gone from wooden boats into the steel era. That's right. We went from steel era into the like boats that was like a hundred foot long, uh, hundred and twenty, yeah. up to two hundred, up to three to three hundred. That was a lot of development over that period of time. That's right. How did the trawl net evolve with that? Well basically when someone pushed him because then asked about uh, ordering a trawl, you know the first question we asked them what uh, what is the, the horsepower of the vessel? So I can determine the size of the of the trawl that you're going to make. Sometimes we ask them the gross tonnage because that gives you thrust too while it's going. And we asked all, all those kind of questions to find out what would be the best net to suit their purpose. Now there's different types of nets. Uh, micro nets that work. Most popular mesh we have for the micro nets, full mesh would be 25 meters 60. Remember, I was telling you we went up stages from, but we always stopped at that mesh size. It seems to be the most popular for the micro. And of course, with the bigger mesh up front, it makes the throttle easier to pull through the water. And uh, another big factor in the twine on the technical side is twine surface area. If you, on the computer program we have now, it can throw up the, the twine surface area on the trawl. So if it's too high, we can work it out what speed you want to tow in, in knots to suit the twine surface area. That's all down to years of experience passed on by what I learned in uh, Sweden and Denmark. So, and uh, other factors is, uh, some some men go pair on 
Some men use tall doors. Tall doors are used for a, it's a kind of a force for pushing out the tall and that helps to open the tall up. So you need to know all them little factors as well. Now, we do a lot of research as well in the flume tank in Herschel's Denmark. We also went to Newfoundland. They have got a tank there. Basically, what do we do? We make scaled down models of our trawls, try them in the flume tank and see how they work and then apply that to a net in reality for the customer. Sometimes we have on vacations taken uh, skippers with us and crewmen to see how this all works. It gives them a great mental picture. We're looking in the flume tank how a net actually works onto the under the sea, yeah. So all all that techno, all that knowledge and the computer has been fed gained in. by your, fed uh, in, so fed been gained by yourself over the years uh, and, and, uh, and others uh, like you. From the guys that trained my course initially in Sweden and Denmark. So looking at it, you know, there, there's a as you said, there's there's the mackerel nets, there's the blue whiting nets. Yeah. And there's the herring nets. They would yeah. be the three main type of uh, yeah. plastic nets that Swan Net would would have made. Which one now would be the most complicated to to make? Let's see. Uh, they basically all are in the same. You know what? Now there's when you're fishing micro, you try to attain a speed from four four and a half to five knots on the blue whiten. You can make a bigger tall because you, if you tore, you can tow the net around three knots for that species. For herring, we are in the four, four knots fishing too. But mesh size is important for the herring too. I think uh, the smaller mesh size in the back end is better for herring than herring for some reason. Yeah. And now, you know, there's, there's the worldwide fisheries out there. And I'm sure, like from speaking to you before, uh, we know that you've been to a lot of different countries. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about some of the places you've been and what what was happening there at the time? Well, one big scoop, two for one, that was breaking into the Alaskan market. It was all brought about by one gentleman from uh, Northern Ireland, Jesse Furnival, who happened to be up in a place called Dutch Harbour. Bird watching, believe it or not. Right. Very famous place these days. <laughs> and uh, I seen all these vessels coming in, landing Alaskan pollock. So uh, when he came back, he went into the harbour and I reckon that he could see potential there for swan nets at the time. So we did sell gear out there and we done very well, very successful. That, that was the time the company was at its best, I'll say. We had worked nearly all year round, you know. And uh, got so successful, we sent men out there as a backup service. A big part of our game is, well, that's the one thing Albert said to me when he interviewed me for the job. He said, are you going to work past, are you willing to work past 5.30? I said, definitely. He says, yeah, as you know, fishing's not a nine to five job. Definitely not. No. And that's the standard we set. And uh, that's why... We set up a base in Seattle for a backup service. And that was run by a good friend of mine, Seamus Melly, who he emigrated there in the 90s. And uh, the fact he's still going there. And it's part of our group now because uh, the major shareholders in uh, Swan Nets now are from Iceland. So they bought into Swan Net Seattle. Now, we're part of the group, even though. The gear I was always still made in Seattle. Yeah. So that's interesting to know that you know that. I suppose this was in the years before Deadliest Catch and yeah. Dutch Harbour, and that was famous on people's TV screens as it, as it is now. So for somebody to be in that part of the world bird watching, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and to come back with such a great idea, well, yeah, yeah. And, and to be inspired to come back with such a great idea, that's right, yeah. was a, it was a great. Great boost for the company. It was a good sales pitch for us, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you're in Chile and other parts of the world as well. I've been to Russia with Seamus Hayden, our former manager. 
1997. And funny when we sat around with the skippers around the table, they were, they were able to inform us that they fished off guinea pigs <laughs> in the early days, you know? Yeah. Uh, they want, we're trying to promote a sales pitch there. Unfortunately, they wanted to barter to make a sale. They wanted to give us twine for the, as collateral against yeah. the sale. But the quality of the twine was not good, so we didn't really go there, you know. But uh, we made different nets for, uh, for Russia after that, all right? And we made nets for Chinese vessels. It was all, uh, it was all uh, by our former director, Martin Hilly, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Martin set up that with a Chinese company. So it's, it's it's a global market. Yeah. Um, where did you see you know in your travels? Where's the, the huge potential? Was it Alaska? Was it at home or at that time it would have been Alaska? I was a home market too in the Shetland and Scotland market. Very good to us, you know. Very good to our company. Like and we appreciate that. We have a backup service to Shetland. Now we send workers up every six weeks. We rotate them on peak season. We have a depot in in uh, Shetland uh, on the shore there beside uh, that company Shetland Catch, you know? and uh, that's a good boost to us. And uh, a good, for, I mean, great friendships down through the years in Shetland, Scotland, and globally. Great friendships down through the years, like that I'll never forget them. You know? I suppose that's that's one of the things that. That is throughout the fishing industry. You go places, you meet people, and yeah. you know they, they'll remember you, and you know you'll you'll remember them. And yeah, yeah. It's 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 one of those situations where there's it's a community all in yeah. itself. It doesn't make any difference. I think really what part of the world you're you're in. There, there's a sense of community there, isn't it? I met one of the Scottish chippers lately out over the show in Aberdeen, you know, <laughs> and he was telling me a good one about Albert. Yeah. We was going to order an at Albert one time. I know they're talking about the gear. He says to Albert, sort of complained to Albert about how expensive his gear was, you know. And Albert says back to him, I thought it was a good one. Nobody ever complains about the price of a rose life. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. Fishing is an expensive industry. Yeah. You know, uh, cost of everything is, is is huge because what you're dealing with is the materials yeah the gear everything is that's right is huge like but the company uh, the Icelandic company that is the shareholders in so on that's they have a place in Lithuania that makes the material for us which makes us kind of competitive in the market you know how so they make the ropes and stuff like the twines and yeah the ropes and stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I've been over there too, like Lafayette now. So, in Swan Net's history, what was the biggest trawl net that was made? Oh, the biggest one I would say was two thousand five hundred and sixty meters circle at the mouth of the trawl. That's it. That'd be for a uh, blue white. Yeah. And where did that one go? Was it a local one or was well, it? Just... it went to uh, one of them went to Shetland. And we sent ones to uh, Faroe Islands too. Yeah. And what years was that in? Was it recently or? Oh, the last couple of years. Yeah. Last couple of years. Yeah. And I suppose the question is what's the smallest net, trawl net that you've made? Well, we can make, that was always our advertisement. We can net, net from 10 half, 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 half up to you name it. <laughs> any any size, any yeah. Anybody who wants a net made, yeah, the company will right. will entertain them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very that's very good to know because uh, I might have a model myself right there. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is true, you know what you're talking about earlier on. There, uh, a model will act the same as the the real thing. Yeah, scale down models. We do try in the tank now. At sea is more reality, though. Mm. Yeah. When you get the flume tank, it's kind of it's fresh water. 
you have the same conditions, as you know what I mean. Yeah. But uh, it gives you a great mental picture. You now, we took people over that tank and they're amazed. Like the, you know, the net was thrown over the board, they wouldn't know. But when they see it in the tank, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Do, and there's a place that we try out new technology. You know, a lot of skippers would ask for new technology and we'd try it out. And it is a constant, constant development. Yeah. So, what would be the biggest change, say, in and in, and in, in, in the net design outside the computers and everything else? What would have been the the massive step up that that created well, the whole ha, new genre of of, of ha, nets? Happy John introduced our that's our major shareholders. Mm -hmm. He introduced a toy a few years ago with the helix. On the twine, right? So that when it hit the water, it would spread automatically. You know? They bought that technology. I think they believe it or not, from a Russian a Russian guy designed it. You know? Yeah, it worked pretty well for us, right? You know? that's that's something else when you the hear helix, about that technology. It's a helix. You yeah. know, you know what a helix looks like. Yeah, spiral going right, yeah. on the twine. And when it hit the water, start we called it the self-spreading twin. Apart from one man saying, "Well, if it's self-spreading, how come we've still used it to throw door?" <laughs> 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 a good point, right? But <laughs> yeah, but there must there is a there is a difference between is there a difference between the the pair trawl and the single trawl at the end of the day? There would be well, uh, normally. Uh, well, depending on the horsepower of the vessels, prior to all, you can make a bigger one, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the te technology is so good nowadays that the single boat trawlers nearly can work the same size as a pair trawlers anymore. By putting in lighter twines, maybe. You wouldn't be, put the twines as heavier in a single boat trawl. Right. Because you'd kill the, the aspect of the net, you know. If you're working a pair trawl now, you need stronger twines for because Boats would be turning and twisting. No, they, they tow parallel. Yeah. But then they're turning and twisting. But then it uh, doesn't seem to be a severe single boat trawl. And there's two factors. A lighter twine is always a fishier net. I've always had that down through the years. From the very first day I started, and it's true. The early models and swan nets were three bridal nets. They were very light twine in them. But they were very fishy fishing edge. You know. well, but, but they wouldn't last on the trawlers that are going nowadays because twine is so light, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Different. Well, suppose the wooden boats as well, steel boats, um have a lot more. Well that's the reason uh, the guy in yeah, Sweden, water. the man in Sweden was named as Bank Severn. Swan net was originally called Severson Thrall. But Albert bought the name out after a couple of years. And uh Came with other directors in there, James Tully and John Buck, the skipper, and Martin Hurley. They were a big boost to the company as well. Because uh, you had feed they were skippers, you see, we had feedback on the gear that was working at sea. Yeah. And you'd get criticism sometimes, you get praise, but it's all built up. You're you're told the problems and how to solve. Them, yeah. You know? Now that was a great help, that technology. Especially when you had customers coming in asking about the boat side of the game, you know. Yeah. I'm all right on the net side of it, but you know, all the the stuff in the wheelhouse and all that, that's where the skippers came in handy as a backup. You know? Well, when somebody who's who's used the gear or who's who's a fisherman themselves and well respected gives you a guarantee or a, a, an idea about how good the gear is, yeah. It, it's a seller. You have to listen to feedback from your customer. Yeah. I'm always a great believer in that. And listen, customers always right. My opinion. <laughs> Generally, yes. <laughs> you have to listen. <laughs> you have to take the the good the good feedback, but you've always listened to the hard feedback too, and try to solve it as quickly as possible. Well, that is always my motto on it. Yeah, the crit criticism is uh, you have to be able to take it because if you don't be able to take it, then you can't improve yeah. where you're going wrong. Yeah. If you ignore what you're doing wrong, 
you're not you're not doing anything right, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've now decided to hang up the boots, so to, to or uh, what would be what would be called in the net design the pencil the way the pencil. <laughs> Uh, no, well, I done every aspect and so on. This. First, I started off, well, I cooperated with Albert from day one in design. And that, uh, but uh, I ran the production on the floor from the beginning, built up the making up team and the repair team. And uh, then in the mid, I think it was late 89, they got CAD trolling. Doubled a bit on CAD trolls design. Then in the mid 90s, Seamus Hayden, our farmer's director, asked me to go into sales because I had a, he said I had a good rapport with the customers. So that was my role from then right up to retirement, you know. So and it went okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the company's still going. I mean, you left it in, in good shape. Well, the sad thing about the fishing industry now, it's a disaster. You know? Yeah, well, it's, it's good. It's well, the boats are off now in what? April? Some of them off to December. Now, I, I think it's a shame on the politicians to move, what or what precision they come in this country to let that happen. Like, you know? Well, it's, it's, it's a huge disappointment. There's a lot of lo great boats decommissioned yeah. down south of Ireland as well. Yeah. You know, a couple in Killy Bags. Great whitefish fleet, ridiculous. My opinion that what else are we going to draw into the northwest of Donegal, where I come from? I was born in Killybeg. Yeah. We're not going to get multinationals in the Killybeg. We have, we have the technology there. We have great companies, net fractors, electric companies, hydraulic companies. We have a lot there. People are telling me that they come from, from uh, other ports. That you nearly get everything in Kelly Vegs that puts a vessel in. So I'm, and I'm afraid of the future. If these politicians don't wake up, we're going to lose all that, you know. We are. We're, we're, we're going to lose it. We're, we're only a matter of a year or two away from losing it. Really. And the success of, I'm talking about Kelly Vegs Port is from talent from Glen to Malin Head, every town, from every, every part of this country. A lot of the boat owners came from south of Ireland, west of Ireland, east coast. It's not only the politicians in Donegal should be looking after us. It's one stay in the country. She'd be looking after that great town that was brought to the town. You know, you know it's ridiculous. Yeah, and you know, Kelly Beggs, not alone is it, is it just the fishing that's in Kelly Beggs that's important. Uh, and 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 that aspect we call the for for the fishermen is important for the whole economical area of the south oh, yeah. southwest. Oh, it is, yeah. It's, it's huge knock on effects. Yeah, yeah. It's as if any companies in Letterkenny, three or four massive big companies in Letterkenny, decide to leave in the morning, there would be a huge cry out on the news about what was happening. But yet, not when it's happening in in the fishing port. Yeah, it's not classified as being of the same value. Oh, it seems to be ignored, right? You know, yeah, but it has jobs are of the same value no matter where they are. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people now I'm written from Kelly Bay's because they can see no future, and that's a shame, like, you know. Yeah, well, that's unfortunately, you know, Kelly Bay's was one of those places with a very had a, it had a good stronghold. Yeah, had a good resilience for young people to come there and live there and 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 to spend their lives there because there was work you could. Go looking for a mortgage. You could get a house. You yeah, could yeah. Do all those necessary things. But once insecurity sets in, that's it. Your, your, that that safety net's gone. Yeah, that's you right. know. And when you take away that safety net, it's not long before all the other parts would start struggling right. as well. Hopefully, it'll come around in the future. So, out of your years, what's one at? What would you say would be your best memories from it? Uh, well, I worked for a very good man in uh, Albert Swan. He was a gentleman, you know. And uh, so were the, all the directors. They're very good to me now, I must say. Memories. Uh, plenty of them. <laughs> I would need to write them down. <laughs> Say that too. Nah. Or you, need to, you need to write your memoirs. Probably the success of the company. We came from 
as they say, humble beginnings, you know, in the, the carpet factory years ago. Built that force factory on the shore road in 1980. It's now, uh, it was sold at the time we emerged with Gondry's in 2002, I think. And that facility was sold. In my own opinion, it shouldn't have been sold because it's a prime spot. But anyway, that's water on the bridge now. But we are, our main production area is now west of the town, out in Russian. Actually, my, both my parents came from that area, believe it or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I suppose uh, success of the company, yeah. It was a good success story, I think, uh, Swannet. Now we're now called Swannet Gundry, of course. It's a good good success story from the start. Yeah, it's it's, it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> it's an amazing feat to achieve worldwide mm. success, to be renowned worldwide. Yeah. Uh, especially in you know really and truly really we, you're talking about. Swanet's been known for years and years and years and years. So its rise was quite must yeah. have been quite quick. Yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 yeah. And, and real terms, like you know. That's right. Yeah. So. Um, Bernie, it's been fantastic speaking to you. Do you want to speak about anything else? I'd like the support I got from my wife and family too. That's another thing I'd like to say. You know, yeah. Down through the years, when it was a late night, I came home. She said to me, what are you working that late for? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's all part of the job. Yeah. I'd love to see the company going on from strength to strength now. No. We have a new director in there now, and he's very forward-looking, yeah. Paul McCray. We always had a good staff, and so on. That's that was one of the twenty four seven service was a big part of the company, you know? and it's still there to this day. Like, well, and I hope it continues. Yeah, well, that's that's one thing. I suppose that people forget is that you know it, it was twenty twenty four seven, and yeah. you know you have you, you do have to think about the family and yeah, yeah. everybody else who's who's given you support and contributions. But it's years. not sad thing at all. It's not twenty four seven as much because uh, the lens the boats are off. You know? Yeah, and that's a shame. Like, well, that's Paul is trying to pursue new markets, which is a good idea. Like, because. You really need exports now, the way the fishing's going in this country. The way we're not being supported. I say that personally from all political life in this country. I want to cop on. <laughs> well, thank you, Bernie, for a very good right. interview. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Pleasure meeting you all.